There you go. So we are now recording and I am passing it over to you. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Before we begin, just know that a live transcript can be opened in a new tab by clicking the transcript button in the top left corner. And for help with that, please um, send a message to Sochi because she is our tech support. Thank you so much, Sochi. I wanna begin this meeting with a land acknowledgement. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards of the lands we are all collectives, collectively standing on. We show gratitude to the Dongva people past and present for caring for this place that was stolen from them and that we now call Los Angeles, but was first Yangna. Today, let us also remember Tongva tribal elder, Julia Bogani, a great Tongva leader who passed earlier this year. I invite you to acknowledge the ancestral people of the land you are currently on by sharing their names in the chat, and also to consider what actions you can take to stand in solidarity and allyship with indigenous people. So welcome to the Women Who Submit Literary Submission Workshop and Orientation. We will begin today's program with Reclaiming My Time, the Writer's Edition. I'm Desiree Zamorano. Sochi is here from Women Who Submit as the leadership team as your tech support. If you are having technical issues or need clarification, please message her directly. In a moment, I'm gonna hand things off to our wonderful facilitator, Rachel Hauselhall. But first, some reminders. This event will be recorded, okay? And can be found later on YouTube. Please be sure you are muted and keep yourself muted throughout the chat. We can also mute you in case something happens. There will be time in the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions from you all. To ask a question, you can raise your little hand in the Zoom box or just raise your hand and wait to be called up. And remember, a live transcript can be opened in a new tab by clicking the transcript button in the top left. So right after this panel, about 11 o'clock, new members are gonna be moved into a breakout room for new member orientation with Sochi Julissa Bermejo. This space will be for a women who submit submission party facilitated by Tisha Reikley Aguilera. And then the Zoom will remain open for co-working until one in the afternoon. Now I get to go to the part that I'm in extra excited about. So I bumped into Rachel Hazel Hall in 2014 and she was doing a reading at, at the Grand Park and I was doing a reading alongside her and I thought she was amazing. And one of her books in her series was coming out and I got to meet her, uh, her family at a different event and everybody was so proud of her. Well, as we all are, because I think since 2014, she has published a novel every single year for a total of 10 novels and with the forthcoming launch of These Toxic Things, which is, oh, thank you, Rachel, thank you. These Toxic Things, which is coming out in September. And so here's a woman who is publishing novel a year, married, raising a child, and brace yourselves, working a full-time job. I don't know how it is possible, but she's gonna give us some hints. And now I'm not promising you, um, you are going to be the next, next Rachel Housel Hall because that role is already taken. Take but she is gonna give us some hints to make our writing lives, to get the most out of our own writing lives. So with, with that, welcome Rachel and thank you for being here, yay. Thank you, Des. Yes, it was such a long time ago when we met and then we had drinks up at that at the, the, the hotel bar and then- The Ace Hotel. The yeah. History. yeah, yeah. Um, and that was a very important part of my journey. Thank you, um, women who submit for letting me come and talk to all of you. I'm, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while because um, women, we have a lot to do. We um, are responsible for so much and there are so many factors that kind of want to just crush us down and keep us in our space. And women creatives need the space to create. So I'm glad that I have a chance to share with you. Um, my writing journey has been an odd one. It's been a long one. Um, right now, I'm a, uh, These Toxic Things is an Amazon first reads and it's number six on the Kindle uh, ratings and all that. And it's funny because some folks are like, you know, you just came out of nowhere and now you're number six on, on Kindle. And it's like, well, actually I've been at this for a very long time. Um, I am a native Angelino. 
Um, I went to Audubon Middle School. I went to a small uh, at Venice High School in Linwood that is no longer there because the city took it over and made another high school because that makes sense. I went to UC Santa Cruz all four years uh, for an English American literature major. And then I came back home because I love Los Angeles, even with its flaws and its traffic. There's something about this city that is unlike any others. We have everything here from the beach to the mountains to all, you know, everything that everyone says Los Angeles has. But Los Angeles also has this weird thing with, with literature and our history of creating and I'm inspired by it. And many of my stories take place in Los Angeles. But even with that, I still didn't believe back in 1992 that I could actually be a writer. There weren't many that uh, wrote genre. I'm a crime writer, I'm mystery crime. And so I thought, you know, especially coming with an English American literature degree, that my voice had to be as heavy as Alice Walker's and Toni Morrison and these big ideas and big explorations of, of, of race and class and very, very important, capital V, capital I. And I was a child who liked, I loved Stephen King. I read Jackie Collins way before I probably was supposed to. Sidney Sheldon, if it was genre, I loved it. And that's what you know I wanted to write, but I didn't see that around me. And so if you can't see things, then how, how do you become them? Um, and back then, this was, you know, between 88 and 92, I was in college. There was no internet. You walk in a bookstore and that was that. You walk in a library and that was that. So I really didn't believe it. I was always a writer. I was the kid who kept a journal and I have all my diaries from fourth grade until you know, two years after college. So I, I chronicled life. I was the sensitive one who, you know, when my parents argued, I'd go sit in the corner, uh, but I'm writing everything that's going down. I was that person. I was drawn to crime because I grew up in from Los Angeles, um, you know, was the, the jungle, which, and Slauson, and it's nice apartments, but it's, you know, it's a nicer kind of ghetto. <laughs> I could see the Hollywood sign from my kitchen window, and that's an aspirational thing. But, you know, I was a poor Black kid who loved books and hated conflict, but was fascinated by conflict and fascinated by the things that we did to each other, the ways we hurt each other. And so I wanted to somehow take all that angst and write it in a book. But again, I didn't see it, not in the way I wanted to see it. It wasn't until I got my first real job out of college. I was 24, it's 1994. And I started work at Penn Center USA West, which is a part of Penn American Center. And if you don't know Penn American Center, it's like Amnesty International for writers. And it was a great organization. But that's where I met a lot of working writers. And that's where I met Gary Phillips. Gary Phillips is a Los Angeles-based uh, crime writer who he's just incredibly warm, very successful. If you write crime or comics or sci-fi, you know Gary Phillips, this big black guy with the big laugh. And he was on the panel with um, Des and I back at that event. And I got to see him work. And I got to meet B.B. Moore Campbell, who wrote uh, these you know, black stories about black women in, in hard times. And in Los Angeles, she wrote Los Angeles stories. And then Tony, uh, Terry McMillan came out with Waiting to Excel. And Walter Mosley came out with uh, Devil in a Blue Dress. And now I'm finally getting to see like black writers writing stuff that contemporary stories, stories about just regular human beings with like straightforward language. It's like that, I wanna do that. And so I wrote my first story and I finally got an agent. This was six years after I started trying to start to write a novel. So it, it took a moment and I would read my then fiance uh, and now husband, uh, David, my bad prose in my studio apartment in downtown Los Angeles over Thai food. It was such, you know, 
a, a stereotypical scene of me reading bad prose. But, you know, it, the drive was there. I was inspired by the people that I surrounded myself with. And, you know, I just sat down and did it. Got married and start searching for an agent. And it took a moment. I landed an agent on, in August, 2000. And it was through, she, she emailed me through this thing called Netscape. We, the internet was just starting. And, you know, this was one of my first ever emails ever in 2000. And, you know, she, Wendy Sherman was my first agent. It took a moment to sell the book. Um, a Quiet Storm was my first novel that I finished and that we were shopping. And it was a story about an African-American family in Los Angeles dealing with mental health issues of the main character, uh, uh, Stacy. Um, so it wasn't a barn burner, but it was a very important story to me. And we sold it, we sold it to Scribner. So my first publisher, was when the, the, the big five, right? And it was a trade paperback. We got, you know, my, my editor was a very talented young black editor from, you know, Yale, which seems to put out a lot of black ladies who do publishing, Yale. And they decided to publish my book on September 11th, 2002, the first anniversary of 9-11. That was difficult because the first anniversaries are usually the biggest anniversaries. And a lot of the bookstores who had thought that they were going to book me decided not to because anniversary stories. Uh, so my novel, while it was, you know, acquired by a big publisher, it kind of fell by the wayside. And also, you know, the first anniversary of 9-11, who really kind of cares about a black family dealing with mental health in Los Angeles? It was the opposite of everything that was going on. Uh, then, you know, that was, it was fine. I thought that I would be able to get another uh, publishing contract because I'd done it before. I was wrong because at this time, there was this genre called urban fiction. That's the so Sister Soldier, Omar Tyree, very, very raw in its um, uh, locations and what is considered black life. And my voice didn't fit in that. And I was told by editors and agents because by now Wendy and I had, had broken up that my voice wasn't, I have emails that say my voice is not black enough or urban enough, which urban, we know what that means. And so it took me a moment, you know, to understand what they were saying because they're like, well, how is my voice not black enough because I've been black all my life. What does that mean? But I couldn't land a deal and I didn't have an agent and it was frustrating. And I'm, you know, had this idea because everyone looks at the Granta 30 under 30 list. I was past 30. I wasn't going to hit that Granta list at the, the, the talented 10th under 30, you know, 30 years old. It, it was looking dire for me. Meanwhile, I am trying to have a regular life. I was married, I am married, but at this, you know, I was young and married and it was time for us to start thinking about uh, children. And my husband and I, we got pregnant and my second OBGYN appointment, my doctor says, hmm, I feel a lump in your breast. What's this about? And she and I both figured, you know, pregnancy brings lumpy breasts. I'm healthy, 33 years old. I go to the doctor all the time. What, there can't be cancer. They don't give mammograms to 33 year, year olds. What, what the hell? But she still sent me to a radiologist just to, just to see. So I went to UCLA and I had an ultrasound and I'm thinking I'm gonna get to go home get to go home and write because that's what I do. And I was the woman who had to stay behind. I'm sure all of us who have been to have mammograms know that there's always that one woman who's sitting in the chair and she's clutching her gown like this. And she was there when you got there and she's there when you leave. I was that woman and I was pregnant. And they didn't like what they saw, these UCLA doctors. And so they sent me to another appointment 
into the next week. And then another appointment until they figured out that I had this rare breast cancer called a phylloides tumor that just happened to land in my right breast while I was pregnant. And the pregnancy, the estrogen from the pregnancy was feeding it and it was getting bigger and bigger with each day. And they needed to figure out if it could stay or if they should wait. And so when I was four months pregnant, they did a biopsy and they determined that, yeah, this needs to come out as soon as we can. And so they waited until my baby, until I was six months pregnant so that that would give uh, my baby some time to grow. And on the day that we voted to recall Bray Davis or not um, in Sacramento, that was the day that I had my surgery. And I remember that it was this day because I worked at the ACLU that time and I was very much into politics and social justice. And, you know, this recall was ridiculous and I had always voted. And here I was getting a partial mastectomy, six months pregnant um, and missing this election. It was crazy. And so, you know, fortunately they got it all out. My baby was born healthy. Maya is now 17 years old. But, you know, a few years after that, I had another cancer scare. And that's when UCLA put me into the high risk program. I'm 37 at this point. And now cancer is a part of my life. And this is when I say to myself, okay, so cancer, I may die either now or years from now, because now it's in my life. What do I wanna do before I leave this earth? My first thing I wanted was to buy a Mercedes Benz because car culture, I'm an Angelino. I wanted a nice car and I had planned to, when I got to be 50, that was gonna be my gift to myself, a Mercedes Benz. But here I am at 37 with cancer in her life. And it's like, well, I may not make 50. So I'm gonna get the car now. And so I got the car. And then I said, well, what else do I wanna do? And it's like, well, writing is one of the most important things in my life. And I wanna write a book that combines Terry McMillan's Waiting to Excel with Walter Mosley's Devil in a Blue Dress and scrunch them up together. I'm not a cop, not then, not now. I wasn't a reporter, not then, not now. I knew nothing about police procedurals except that I loved reading them. Um, and so I said, yeah, I'm gonna write this story that I want to read and you know, fuck it. I'm here, I'm gonna do it before I, before I die. And that's gonna be that. And my husband's for like a lot of the conferences, he sent me off to, you know, the Writers Police Academy and BoucherCon in 2012 or whatever time it was. Um, I read all the Michael Connolly books. I did all this stuff so that I could write this one story and be done and say, okay, Lord, if, you, if it's time for me to go, I've done that thing that I could do. And that was Land of Shadows, that, that fuck it book. It's like Eloise Norton, she went to school with me. She pledged the same sorority I did. She grew up in the jungle like me. And, you know, part of me, I was scared a little because I didn't know that world. I, like I said, I wasn't a cop. I was nothing in a, a role I, that really focuses on procedurals. I didn't do that. But, you know, while there's a little fear, my biggest fear I'd already done, you know, my mortality, losing my child to cancer. That was scary. Writing in the book, whatever. I can handle that. And so, yeah, I wrote that, that draft. And then I'm like, okay, well, let me send it off. And I sent it to an agent in San Diego, Jill Marshall, uh, with the Marshall Lion Agency down in um, Del Mar. And she loved it. And she sent it out into the world. And a young editor at Forge, which is a part of Macmillan, she loved it. And they, they bought two and then they bought two more. And then one Friday, uh, I got a call from my agent, from Jill. And she said, you know, 
James Patterson's editor reached out to me and he likes your LA stories and he doesn't have an LA story. And he was wondering if you like to co-write a story with him and the rest is history. I say all this to say that everyone's journey is not the same. You know, we all look at people and we say, man, they got it easy. People look at me all the time. It's like, oh, she has it easy. And we're all in many ways like ducks on a lake where you look like you're gliding, but your little legs are under there, like just trying to keep you afloat. And writing has helped to keep me afloat. Um, it has been my therapy. It has been my confessor. It has been the way uh, that I work things out. It's funny that um, I wrote uh, this book called, and now she's gone, there it is. And it's a story about a private investigator, her name is Grayson Sykes. And her first big case is to find someone who doesn't want to be found, a woman who doesn't want to be found. And there's some questions about abuse and you know, big, big women issues. And someone complained to me is about, you know, being triggered when I, you know, when she read the book. And I'm thinking to myself, well, these issues trigger me with, and that's why I'm writing them. Because writing again is my therapy. Now, I, I wish I could say that I made so much money that I didn't have to work, but I do have to work because you know, only 1% of people uh, get paid like that. And also there's this thing where I like going into the grocery store and being able to afford any kind of cheese I want. And that requires me to have a job. I also have a daughter, she's 17 and she's wonderful. And I, we, we love her so much and she's an only. And because of the way she came into this world as a little fighter, uh, we dote on her a lot. Um, we we're just so freaking happy that she she made it past all my surgeries and and all the drugs that I had to be you know going under for surgeries, and so you know she's in soccer and she's uh, goes to private school and she needs money for Sephora and she you know all these things that girls need money for, you know she works her ass off because that's just the type of you know it's a benevolent dictatorship in my house. But, you know, she requires money and I like spending money and I don't like, I grew up poor. So I don't like not having something in the bank. So I work full time, but the jobs I do um, are all meaningful. Um, if I'm going to spend my days working, I want to do it to help someone else. So my job's Penn Center USA West and then the ACLU. Uh, I was a frontline fundraiser asking people for money. And I absolutely hated it because, you know, I'm a writer. I don't like, ugh. I'm not a salesperson. But then it's like, well, I want to do this type of nonprofit work, but I want to do the writing of it. And so I found a job at City of Hope and it was a fundraising writer. So I would take very hard ideas um, of what the scientists were doing in the lab and my job was to make it all simple, make it like the third to fifth grade reading level. That was my job to ghost write thank you letters, to do all this kind of writing, use my superpowers for good. And now I am at Cedar sinai which it's been exhausting as you could probably imagine dealing with the pandemic. It's been COVID communication after COVID communication and how do we say that and what don't we say, but I get to get up and say, yeah, this kind of sucks because I want to do that thing where I'm writing all day, but praise God, I have a great job, a meaningful job, a job that pays me well, a job where I am helping save and improve the lives of so many people, but it can be daunting and exhausting. And sometimes I am really tired, but I do it. Now, you want to know how I do it? Well, Part of it is that drive, that saying, this is who I am. This is what I do, accept it or don't. My husband was very smart to say, I accept that. I, that's, that's, who, that's who I, it's never been a lie. He met me and listened to me read bad prose in my downtown apartment while eating Thai food 24, 26 years ago. 
And so you can't be surprised when I say, I wanna keep writing. So that has helped. Um, me being okay with being tired, that has helped. Me saying that writing has saved my life, that has helped. But those are ideas. How did I actually do it? Well, I get up at 4.40 every morning. My best writing is done with a clear head. My best writing goes to me. I don't give Cedars my best writing. I give me my best writing. And that's at four, well, 4.50 because I have two cats and a dog. And so they need to be fed and they need to go out to pee. And I sit down at 4.50 to write. Then I write until about 7.30. I technically am supposed to be at work at seven to start my, you know, start my day job, but they don't know. So don't tell them please that I'm not actually starting work at seven. Uh, so yeah, I 4.50 to 7, 7.30, I'm writing. Then I work my job. At lunchtime, I write. When I had to go into the office, I would write in my car. I even named my blog writing in my car because that's where I'd go. It's quiet, it's clean. No one can buy, uh, find me, bother me. Um, you know, let the windows down, but write in your car. Then after that, you know, I pick up my daughter from school and most likely back then she had some type of practice, basketball practice, volleyball practice. I would use those times to write. Now it may not be fresh writing. It may be entering my edits into the computer. Oh. I write my first drafts longhand, all of them. Every single draft I've written, the first draft is longhand. One, because you know I was born in 1970 and that's how we did things. Also, I like pens. I like pens and notepads. Further, you can shove a pen and a notepad in your purse and don't have to, you don't have to worry about charging things or the little red squiggly lines or the little green squiggly lines, you just write. So at these practices, I whip that thing out and I write, or I whip out my, my, my laptop and I write from there. I use every moment that I can to write. I had car to take my car into service last week. I wrote there. Um, when I'm stuck in traffic on La Cienega Boulevard, I have little notepads and I'm writing there. I'm writing, writing, writing. And what is the importance of writing every day? You know, again, you, this, everyone's writing journey is different. But since you invited me here, I'm telling you, writing every day is important. I didn't say writing good stuff every day is important, but writing every day is important because one, you get to feel like you're doing something. You get to see yourself in action. You get to apply and apply everything that you learned yesterday into what you're doing today. So many things you know, are happening in Los Angeles and that's a great thing for a writer, like so many random things. And it's like, well, oh my God, that just happened. I wanna write that down. And so you go and you know, somehow incorporate that into your draft. Writing every day, like I said, it doesn't have to be meaningful writing, but it should be the practice of writing every day. If it's for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if it's researching, if it's you know doing your web clipping with your Evernote or however you clip your notes, it should be something that stimulates you and makes you excited about the story that you're working on. So get up or, or stay up late. I don't know if you're a, a, a daytime a night writer or a day, but make sure you have that time carved out. Make sure that your loved ones know that this is your time. You need this moment to do what you need to do. Um, I can't close any doors because cats don't give a fuck about doors and they will scratch. And then my old, I have a golden retriever who's very old and she's blind and she likes sitting beneath my chair every morning. So, you know, you deal with your distractions, but, you know, move past that and sit down and do it every day. So writing every day um, is important. Also keeping an active list of things that you see or hear, you know, any kind of stimulus. I, um, have, I have an Evernote, as I mentioned, 
And anything that I see that's interesting or funny or bizarre or can somehow fit into a story, not maybe this one, but maybe that one, I keep it. I, and, and my daughter, whenever she sees something bizarre or funny, she now sends it to me. My husband does the same. Get every, it's a group activity. Capture all these things that are interesting to you that may come handy later because you never know, but just keep that thing somehow in a receptacle. Also remember that every story is not gonna sell. For, and now she's gone, it's a story within a story. It's a procedural story of Grayson Sykes trying to find this woman. And it's a story about a woman named Natalie Dixon who is running away from an abusive marriage. The abusive marriage part of the story that story came out of a, the story that I wanted to write and sell after A Quiet Storm. That was the story that, that editors said wasn't black enough or urban enough. They didn't buy that story, but it was important to me. And I knew there was something in it that was worth me sharing. And so I trunked that story, but I still thought about it. I just didn't know how to write it. And that's a wonderful thing about writing. There's no expiration date. I find that the older I get, the better my writing gets because, you know, it's, it's, I'm learning, you know, you learn and you look back and you reflect. And as a mom, I'm learning how to, you know, talk to my daughter about things or being introduced to new concepts and her struggles and all the rest of it. And all of that enriches writing. And so it took, you know, from 2003 until two years ago to figure out how to write that trumped novel. I needed to write the Lou Norton star stories first. I needed to write the James Patterson story first. I needed to write They All Fall Down first before it clicked. And it's like, I know how to do it. And I knew because I had been writing that procedural that I could nest this very domestic story inside this procedural, but it took me a moment. So don't ever feel like the manuscript that you're working on now that doesn't sell isn't worth anything. You just may not know how to write it. One day you will. One day when you're capturing and web clipping and doing all these, you know, uh, keeping things and, and trunking things, you will figure it out. Your brain will figure it out. That's Again, a wonderful thing about being a writer is just watching how your conscious works things out overnight sometimes or over years sometimes. So yes, don't throw anything away. Um, keep that pen moving. That's important. Um, what else? Don't be discouraged. I mean, it was heartbreaking to receive those projections from agents and editors. But one thing a writer is good for is being petty, right? Um, these toxic things, the one, the story that's number six right now on Kindle, and it's not even out yet. Last year when we shot that, um, I had decided to break up with my publisher. I love them, but I needed more. And Thomas and Mercer, which is um, one of Amazon's publishing houses, they could possibly give me that more. So Jill and I, we took the novel out wide. There were some editors who I like worshiped in houses that I could imagine seeing myself beside because it's like, I'm here. I've, I've done all this stuff. You have to say yes to me. I was rejected. There were some editors who rejected these toxic things. Editors who's like, who, who have told me, oh, we, I love your twisty stories. They're so wonderfully twisty and you always end and it's crazy. I can't wait to work with you. And here was this opportunity to give them this twisty different story. And they're like, it's too twisty. I don't get it. It seems complicated. And it's like, well, you asked me for a synopsis and so you're seeing the workings and all the stuff that I put into making that twisty thing. Like if I read the schematics for an airplane, I would be like, this shit's too twisty. It's impossible. How are they going to get a plane? This makes no sense. No one does that. Editors do that. They don't trust you to pull it out, even though they like the stuff that 
you know, you've done in the past. And so they rejected these toxic things. And now they see that, yeah, I, I told you I could do this and I did it and Amazon has it and they're selling a shitload of books, but you didn't trust me. Ha ha, ha ha ha. So embrace the petty. Don't get discouraged because, you know, something that doesn't work for them may work for them over there and that may not be overnight. So get up every day, embrace the petty, keep your stuff, go to, um, go to, go to as many conferences as you can. And if you can do it on someone else's dime, there's some, some organizations out there like Sisters in Crime, if you write books, um, AWP, I'm sure women who submit, they have workshops. Take advantage of as many activities as you can, but also you know, know that it's gonna take a moment. And all we have as writers is time. And we're one of the few arts that we can take our time writing something beautiful um, and put so much of ourselves on a page. There's no time limit, but there is a time limit because the story is waiting to get out of you. Um, are we at questions now? We're not, but if you want to open it up, we can. Yeah, let's, I, yeah because people may have specific things. So I will talking. just start with some in the chat. Do you count editing as part of your writing? Heck yes. Editing, that's okay. I hate writing first drafts. Don't tell anybody that I said that. I love editing because, you know, I don't know those people in the first draft. I have no idea who they are. I've spent all this time with my heart, you know, with my pen and paper writing about these strangers and editing is when it's like, oh, she's an INFJ personality. That's the, the counselor. She's, oh, she's a cheetah. Oh, she's a dog. You know, all these, I get to finally know people in edits. Edits is also where, you know, you, you know what the story is that you want to tell, that story that you had in your head or in your outline or cards. And that's where you get to shape and make the art. And I count editing as, oh, hell yeah, because editing's hard. And that's where, that's, that's where the action is. Yeah, I, I go through, my novels typically are 90,000 words. Um, and from start to finish, where I'm ready to send it off, it takes me nine months. Um, the bulk of that is editing because I edit, I maybe do about three rounds of edits. The hard edit where it's like, I don't know what this is. This is all crap. It looks like a wet cat. That edit, and then another edit, cleaning it up. And then that last edit where it just, you know, it sings because now you know who the people are you know, what the plot's supposed to be. And now you're just like really kind of shaping it. So yes, editing totally counts. Editing is the best part of writing. Great, I think that answered Deborah and a lot of us. Uh, side question, what's your golden retriever's doggy's name? Her name is Lucky. Her name is Lucky and she is, she's a sweetheart. Um, Gus Gus and Major were named after the C Cinderella's uh, mice. They're brothers and they're two, uh, they're two tux, tuxy cats. Great. So Ashley is asking a perfect question. What do you do when you're having a bad day? Too tired, too grumpy. What do you do, Rachel? I give push us, through give it. Give us a secret sauce. I push through it because writing is my joy. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yes, there are times when it's like, this is crap. This is crap. This is crap. But I do it because how else is it going to come out? How else am I going to push past the crappy thing, things I don't understand or don't know, I put an outline for me to come back and circle back to it later. I just want to get to that exit. Um, when I'm really feeling down, well, first of all, I don't read, it, I don't read other people's writing that's in my genre. So if I'm writing, I won't read, you know, at a clock or I won't read Michael Connelly. I won't read those, the, my heroes, because reading them would just depress me. It's like, I can never do that. But I will read, you know, a nonfiction book. I will go on to Goodreads and look at other people's reviews and kind of, you know, 
see how much people think Megan Abbott sucks or Laura Lipman sucks or all these women that I admire getting one and two stars. It reminds me that not everyone's going to like what I'm doing, that even they stumble sometimes. I look for encouragement everywhere, but I still get up because no one can tell the story that I want to tell. And I have to, I have to tell the story. Okay, I just want to underline what she just said. No one can tell the story I want to tell. I, I think all of us here have to embrace that as a, as a, as a beacon yeah. to go forward. Um, I want to pause. And that's, a, and that's a, another quick thing I want to say. It's like when you're choosing writing projects, when you're choosing that novel to write, be sure that you're excited about it because it's already hard. Don't write something just because it's a trend or because someone else is doing it. Write it because it's in you and, and you're... That's how you can tell, well, that's how I can tell when this is actually the book, when I can't wait to get and sit in my chair and just go at it, even the crappy parts, because that's, that, that excitement is going to drive me through to the, the, the eight edits that I'm doing. Someone has to tell it, and it has to be me. So I'm, I'm going to go to another question. You did not self-publish this book, right, on Amazon. It's no, on I did Kindle. Who's, who, is the, um, who is the publisher for this one? For these toxic things, it is Thomas and Mercer. So okay. Amazon has publishing. They're you know they have yes. formal publishing houses. But I did self-publish two books in that long time when everyone's telling me no. I did because Amazon had just come out with the Kindle, the self-pub Kindle platform, and it was getting me. Those two books were getting me closer and closer to writing a full out, full blown procedural. It was very important for me to get those stories up, to get feedback, to grow bolder in my um, approach to storytelling and you know the, the women that I wanted to center in my stories. Beautiful. Alex, I hope, I hope that answers your question. And Carrie, I hope that answers your question of how she powered through chemo and cancer, right? I mean, writing was your yeah. joy, if I'm understanding it correctly. It was a great distraction. Um, it, you know, I, I look back at some pages of Land of Shadows and it's like, I remember where I was when I wrote that. When my editor decided to buy Land of Shadows and another one, I was literally, my phone is sitting in my purse on top of my folded clothes in, in the exam room at um, UCLA and the phone brightens in my purse and I see Jill Marshall in the phone and that's when she was calling to let me know that Kristen Sevick at Forge wanted to buy two books. So all of, all of this recent writing career has centered around my healthcare. On the morning that I was supposed to turn in my edits to uh, James Patterson and his editor for my story with them, I had a surgery at 11 o'clock that morning and I got up at 4.40 and I'm you know sitting, getting ready to go have surgery writing, they all fall down. So it, writing has been the ultimate distraction besides being a mom, but the ultimate distraction of me working out problems, me infusing my real fear into the fear that I'm putting on the page. I know what it is to be scared. And so when it comes to me helping or, or, or crafting uh, a heroine's emotional journey, and running from boogeyman, I know that firsthand. And I'm saying to you, if you're not doing it now, channel all that that you're experiencing into your writing. Just infuse it with those very real emotions that you face every day. The fear of being a woman in LA with the craziness, the fear of being a, a color of person, being, you know, seeing a cop and hoping that this time you don't, you know, get stopped. Sending your child out into the world and hoping that you'll see them again infuse all that into your writing and no one will tell you that you're a lie because you know what it feels like you know what it feels like to be scared and to be to, to have joy to you know get your paycheck and go buy the fancy cheese at the Ralph's you know that that's that's all so important when it comes to writing just tapping your emotions in your life and your real experience into what's on the page Thank you, thank you, Rachel. I have a, I have a couple I'm gonna kind of squeeze together. Do you have a circle of beta readers? If so, how do you? Uh -huh. 
And how do you deal with feedback? How do you decide valid feedback and feedback that should be ignored? So my only reader outside of my agent and my editor is my husband, David. Um, he is a creative, so that's important. He's visual more than, but he loves great stories. And so he doesn't read. I actually read to him because he takes way too long to read. And, you know, writers were crazy control freaks. And so I read to him. This is important because I get to hear the words. And this is another form of editing, reading aloud. I get to hear what's on page. And if something's dragging, then it's like, oh, this is, this is not good. Let me circle this. Um, if he's yawning or he picks up his phone or the game controller or something, that's a cue. He's bored or not engaged. I circle that part. He um, tells me when I am being very smart. He tells me when I'm being way too descriptive. He is brutally honest sometimes, but he's usually always right. And but before I admit that he's you know usually right, it pisses me off. He'll say something and it'll be like, well, I meant to do that. And oh, you obviously don't know, but I'll circle it and I'll go to bed kind of angry. But then the mind does things. And when I'm, you know, when I wake up the next day, it's like, ah, he was right. So yeah, I kind of, you know, I'm very protective. Like every, you know, every creative, we're all like that. You're very protective of this new young baby bird of a book. But I know he loves me and I know he admires me and I know he wants me to succeed as much as I want to succeed because if I succeed, then my daughter reaps the benefits of that success. So he would never steer me wrong because he's an asshole. So I trust him ultimately with everything that I tell him because I know his intents are pure. Um, so, so if I'm understanding uh, correctly, you actually never have feedback that should be ignored. Correct. Okay. I think, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, even, okay. So there's some petty tyrants on Amazon and Goodreads. And if they're giving you one star, two stars, I don't listen to them, but those three stars, I will read those and I'll see, Hmm, what are they saying that could be possibly true? Because I want my writing to improve. No one can ever tell me anything that, you know, I won't think about when I get editorial letters, sometimes I, you know, get a little ticked off with some of those things. And it's like, really, really, you're, you're dinging me on that. But then I step away. I step away and I don't attack the book. I just let my mind figure it out and see if it's a valid thing or not. A lot of times, you know, they they are valid. And if they're not valid, what led them to think that? Cause then I'll need to switch. Cause that, that wasn't my intent. Let me kind of reshape it. I don't, I don't accept all edits. I'll step some things, but I always think about it. I, I take a moment to step back and do something else and then come back to it the next day. Your brain would have worked out whatever, whatever criticism that person's offered. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I have another question here. Have you ever had to give up on a story or a concept? Did something stop singing to you? Um, yes. I have a bunch of those, um, but like I said about um, the story that I was trying to publish after A Quiet Storm, I don't throw them away. I keep them. There are about four books that I stopped and started. Well, I started and stopped that it's like, oh, this is kind of boring. I, I know what I want to do, but it's taken me too long to get to there. And for those of us who write genre, it has to move. It has to to pull people in and it wasn't pulling me in but I know next year or two years from now or even seven years from now I will figure out how to write that book so yes there are plenty of times where it's like oh yeah but then you know I I cannibalize old stuff and make it into to new just keep it all fabulous I love I love hearing about the cannibalization I've got some mm -hmm. things out there cannibalize. Uh -huh. All right, folks, I would love to open it up to further. I was going through the questions in the chat. If you have something, wave wildly at me or, okay, or put up the question emoji. So I'm looking or unmute if I'm ignoring you. 
I, as I'm waiting for somebody to articulate their thoughts, I do have a question for you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is a couple of times you've said, I don't read other crime writers while I'm writing. Well, it sounds to me like you're writing 100% of the time. So when the heck are you, do you ever get around to your genre? Yes, yes, I do. And that's on like real vacation. Um, or if I'm between projects, like this year, we finally got to go on real vacation. Um, I really needed it because a year and a half of my job really is demanding. I mean, we raised over $20 million the first three months of COVID. And a lot of that was I was writing proposals and reports on what we were doing. And I, you know, the world was shut down. So no one got to get away. I didn't get to get away. I've been very good at separating my writing life from my novel writing, my, um, my professional life. But now with everything smushed together, I didn't get to do that. So no real vacation. But this year, um, back in July, we went to Cabo for a week and I read like three books in, in seven days. I just, yeah, I, I, because I missed it. Um, I do read my genre in between projects, like at Christmas time, I try and finish things like before big events. So I'm gonna, the book I'm writing now, I'm trying to finish all edits with my developmental editor um, before Thanksgiving, because between Thanksgiving and the new year, I'm thinking about another book. And that's when I read to see what people are doing, what tricks I wanna you know, figure out how to do. So real big okay, I, just, I just I just want underlined here. She's got a book coming out in September. She's writing a book and she's thinking ahead to the next one. All right. So I'm also going to put that in in case some of you have one book that you've been toiling over for five, six, seven years. Yeah. Start another one, people. Start yeah. another one. Okay. Yeah. You'll come, you'll come back to it. No, but it's true. It's it's immersing yourself in in, in the all of it, from writing your own stuff to reading other people's stuff to thinking and, 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 and saving those things that you want to try. But you have to, you do have to read um, good stuff to, to, to be inspired and to, to figure uh, out. I'll just throw in something that Steph Cha has said. Uh -huh. She reads for every trashy or, you know, not trashy, genre novel, she reads something challenging. So uh -huh. she pairs off that way. She's yeah. way ahead of me on the challenging stuff. I like escapism. You know, life is life is hard as it is. Give me well, a happy ending, please, please. Well, I, I read I read nonfiction, but it's like Eric Larson, creative nonfiction. You know, Devil in the, in, Devil in the White City was incredible. It's like medicine, but entertaining. John Krakauer. You know, I read those types of really good non creative nonfiction. Which also feeds your creative brain those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. I have a couple of more questions here, Rachel, and this will probably uh -huh. hit team. Um, so just lost it. Where to go? Oh, do you, do you watch any streaming TV at all? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I am a Gen Xer. So TV is a, an important <laughs> part of my life. You know, I um, have been streaming manifest lately only because I, I started it because I caught a head cold, which terrified me last week. And I was on the couch and it's like, what can I read that I may possibly fall asleep to? And I like, people talk about manifest. So I'll read, I'll look at it. So that, um, I, I'm all over the place with my, my viewing habits. We watched Master Chef last night because, you know, they're good. And I like good stories. Good stories abound and streaming TV, you know, enjoy it for the moment because they're, the writers are probably going on strike as they should because the companies are getting paid, but they're paying writers like crap. I believe just it. Just the way the world. So yes, TV plays a lot into this brain. And for our final question, is there anything special you do in order to separate your work writing from your book writing? Do you use a different space or something? How do you make that difference? I used to back in the days when there was no work at home, um, had a different space for that. Now, the only, now that it's all mushed up, pens signify that special space. I like really nice pens, right? And I like gels. And so I have a set of gels for work and a set of pens for novel writing. And I never cross mix them because that is now my separation. Um, I must say though, that writing full-time has 
help me write novels. It has helped me do the push past being, you know, tired or whatever to write because Cedars doesn't care that I have a headache. They need that letter written. They don't care that I don't have the words. You need to find the words. We're paying you to find the words. And so I have a writing muscle. You push through it and eventually it's going to, it'll be something soon. It may not be the best, but that's what drafts are for. So yeah, the pens signify uh, that division uh, because there, there is no more division since it's all in my house right now. All, all, all. Yes. Um, team, give us a round of applause. Let's see, let's applaud our delightful, wonderful presenter. Incredibly. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. I like sharing. I like sharing. I really, I, I really do. And I'm glad I had a chance to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. You're all, you're all that. You are all that, Rachel. Thank you so much. Well, Delightful. So I just want to thank you. And um, Sochi is going to place a little form in the chat to help us with feedback. So let us know what you think. And we're going to take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, new members will be moved to a different room and uh, for orientation with Sochi and current members are invited to stay in the space with Tisha for sharing submissions and goals. If you are new to Women Who Submit, please help us create the breakout room by using the rename feature in Zoom to place an N in parentheses before your name. Um, Sochi's gonna put the directions up and with our next slides. All right, folks, now is our break. Come back in 10 minutes. I'll, I'll round to 12.05, oh, 11.05, thank you. okay? Thank you, Desiree. So yeah, 11.05, I'm gonna stop recording now. Thank you.